So I appreciate everybody making time for me. I wanted to talk through today with our time together uh, kind of three, three main items, uh, all related to how to reverse engineer having a career that you really love. Um, the first of which is just a little bit of um, science and some stories related to, you know, as, as professionals, we can do just about anything that we want to do, and I'll explain what I mean by that. The second thing is, okay, if you've got, if you can do anything, um, how do you decide among all the any things you can do, what is the best fit for you personally? And then uh, finally, how do you, you know, narrow down and pick a single, you know, a single job? So let's get started. So I want to start off with a, uh, a story. And the story I wanted to share is about uh, George Dancing. And uh, George was a uh, undergraduate uh, in statistics. He loves statistics. Um, and he actually went to the U.S. Uh, Census Bureau uh, before deciding he wanted to go back to graduate school. And he went to apply to and was accepted into UC Berkeley. Now, as a brand new graduate student, um, at that time, when you were accepted, you were actually accepted by a specific advisor. And his first class was with his new advisor. And he rewarded his new advisor by uh, oversleeping and showing up late uh, for class. And so he gets in class, he sits down, he looks at the board, and uh, he sees these two problems on the board. He's like, oh, okay, that's, you know, copy down my homework. Um, first, you know, kind of first homework assignment in his, uh, his new class. And man, he's like working on these assignments and boy, introductory statistics here is harder than I thought. And he's really kind of struggling to get through them. Um, so he finally finishes them late and uh, he turns them in to uh, his advisor who is uh, Jersey Nyman. And um, you know, some time passes and on a Sunday morning, there's a banging on his door and he gets out of bed and he goes downstairs and it's his advisor and uh, he's saying, you know, why, why are you banging on my door? And he says, well, good news, I've, I've got those two papers that you, uh, you know, f discovered ready to publish. It's like, what are you talking about? So it turns out that those actually weren't homework assignments that were on the board. They were two famous unsolved problems in statistics. Like that, that's what uh, George had worked on without knowing it. Uh, they actually became his dissertation. And, you know, George goes on to uh, have a stellar career in mathematics and, and computer science. He wins the uh, National Medal of Sciences in 1975. Uh, so he has a brilliant career. So why am I sharing this story? Well, um, I think one of the interesting aspects of the story is that George didn't know he couldn't solve those problems, right? He, he thought they were just homework assignments. And in fact, he thought they were homework assignments for introductory statistics. So like he thought like, crap, if I don't solve these problems, you know, it's, it's really on me. Um, and so that just, it raises an interesting question, which is what would you do with your career, with your life, if you knew you couldn't fail? What would, you, what would you choose to pursue? I want to share some, uh, some other research I find fascinating. And this is by uh, a scientist by the name of Anders Ericsson. And what he studies is um, basically expert level performance. And he has studied the expert level performance and how people uh, achieve expert level performance in a huge variety of fields. Everything from violinists to chess grandmasters, um, medicine, math mathematics, just a huge uh, disparity of different fields. And you know, what he has found, I think is uh, you know, just fascinating, which is basically some of the what he's found, you say, well, in retrospect, that's obvious, right? Like, so the parts of the brain that cover, that control uh, fine digit movement are actually bigger in an expert violinist than the average person. Um, and the parts of the brain that, that are related to spatial uh, reasoning are, are much, are bigger in mathematicians. But the interesting thing is those differences are actually caused by practice. So he studied this for a long enough period of time to basically be able to prove pretty conclusively that the act of practicing something you love changes your brain to make it more capable to do the thing that you love. Um, so one of the ways this is manifest is uh, what you may have heard of in, in Malcolm Gladwell's book, um, the, the 10,000 hour rule. So if you've read any of Malcolm Gladwell's work, I think it was the uh, outliers was where he talked about the 10,000 hour rule. This is actually what the 10,000 hour rule actually is. So this is a study of violinists 
and you can see that you know, like the best violinists are the green curve here. These are people who are going to go on to be you know leaders if of uh, you know first seat and first in the symphony kind of people, right? This is they're among the best in the world. Um, the good are going to get jobs as professional musicians, but they're not going to be first seat in the symphony. And the uh, orange uh, are going to be teachers. So they're going to have a career in music, but it isn't going to be performing in front of large audiences. And the, the number one distinguishing characteristic between these different groups is the cumulative amount of practice. You know, your brain changes based on practice. It becomes more capable of whatever it is that you choose to do. Uh, and it is largely within your control. Now, each of us is, I'm not saying that each of us as humans don't have different strengths and starting points and, and things that we're better at versus not, but um, the majority of this is within your control as an individual, which I think is, um, I, I find that inspiring. I think that's great, a great message. So again, key question. If uh, you knew you couldn't fail, what would you choose to do? And I say it that way because largely whether or not you were successful is about how much effort and uh, perspiration you put into your, you know, something that is a passion uh, for you. Okay, so let me talk about discovering what you want. It's really about finding a career that you will love. And uh, you know, at MIT, there's an expression, uh, I-H-T-F-P, which is I hate this F place, um, which uh, that, that is true for many students. And so like, you don't want to have that experience like for your whole life. You want to have, you want to replace the uh, H with an L, uh, hopefully, uh, in your career. And so I'm going to walk through some logic um, that I've personally found very helpful. And as I thought about it a lot, I found worked uh, pretty well based on a lot of other research that other people have done. Um, and basically, it's about thinking about what you want to do in the context of four different dimensions. Um, so one dimension is what do you actually do? And the second is who do you do it with? And then you think about that in two different time frames, right? You think about it like daily and you think about it over a career. So the whole notion is if you kind of enjoy every day, that's good. And if those each day is like a step on a journey, if the journey you go, you, you're on takes you to a place you really want to go to, that's good too. Um, and so you want both. All right, well, let's pick this apart. Um, so has anyone ever done one of these? Yeah, so what, what is it? Sudoku. Sudoku, right? And so, so why do you do Sudoku? So someone who said yes, why do you do Sudoku? Challenging. 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 Yeah, stimulating. Any other? It's fun. Anything else? Focus. You get to focus, yeah. So all those things are true. Here's another uh, answer to that question. So um, there's a, a behavioral psychologist at the University of Chicago, Mihaly Csikszentmihalyi, uh, and yes, I did practice saying his name. Um, and his whole life's work is the study of creativity and happiness. And you know, the center point of his, one of his major discoveries is a state of uh, mental uh, acuity, which he refers to as flow. And so, you know, we all uh, probably have had experiences where uh, we've been in flow. You know you're in flow basically if you're able to uh, concentrate on something so intensely that time seems to disappear, right? So if you think about like with uh, reading a really good novel or um, doing Sudoku, like all of a sudden 20 minutes went by or an hour went by, and you're like, oh, where'd that hour go? That sensation of feeling like time flew that is the hallmark of you having been in flow. Does that make sense? And so there are four preconditions for entering flow. You know, you, you need a clear goal. Um, and so obviously with Sudoku, it's about filling the grid with numbers according to the rules of the game. You need some form of immediate feedback. So, um, you know, with Sudoku, again, mistakes become obvious within a few uh, moves. Uh, you need the skill to be matched with the challenge. So um, again, with Sudoku, it comes in easy, medium, and hard. So if you're a beginner, it's easy to get a, a, a grid that is matched with your uh, skill level. And then finally, you can't be self-conscious. So uh, if you're self-conscious, you your brain won't let you get into flow, basically. But Sudoku is not typically a public activity, so most people are not very self-conscious uh, when uh, they're doing um, 
Sudoku. So that's, at the, in a nutshell, like why is Sudoku as a, as a game good at, at getting you into flow? It's for these reasons. It's actually almost, I don't know if it was designed with this in mind, but it has all the characteristics of a great puzzle in the sense that um, you know, time disappears for most people when they're doing it. So how do you find flow? So flow is a good thing. Uh, I didn't walk through, I don't know, a slide on this, but you know, what a lot of research shows is that flow is good for you. So it's, it's not just pleasant, it actually is good for you. The absence of flow, by the way, is also bad for you. So they've taken people and deprived them of, of flow for like several days on end. And the symptoms that you have are very uh, similar to mental illness, actually. You, you, you know, we all crave it, we all need it to a certain extent. Um, so how do you find it? How do you know what it is that, uh, as, as a way to spend your time, that is great for you in terms of getting yourself into flow? Well, the way that um, Mihail I and his uh, researchers you know, really unpacked flow was through um, a method of data collection that they actually invented called the experience sampling method. And so basically what they did and what you, know, you can also do is you interrupt yourself uh, at random times during the day. And uh, so you just you know, set an alarm on your phone or whatever. And when your alarm goes off, you write down what you were doing, you know, the time, the setting, you know, who you're with, and your level of flow, right? So, and that, which is subjective, right? But if you, if you feel like, whoa, I just, you know, 20 minutes just disappeared on me, uh, you know, give yourself a five. And if you're like, that was, I was counting every second just now, then give it a one, you know? So the point being that um, you can gather data on your day on like literally what puts you into flow and what isn't. And then you can start looking for patterns. And you, for most people, unpacking those patterns is enormously illuminating as to uh, what you know, put them puts in the flow. What you can't do is just say to yourself, well, what puts me in the flow? And the reason you can't do that is the very nature of flow is time gets distorted. So your ability to reconstruct what puts you into flow is by its very nature, you know, you're not a very reliable witness, actually. So the, the whole point of the experience sampling method is to overcome one of the, th the primary uh, problems with asking people about when they're in flow because we don't generally remember when we're in flow. Um, so in any case, that's something you can discover about yourself. There's something else that I think is really important to finding a good vocation, a good profession, which is, you know, different individuals are quite different in the amount or in nature of human interaction that they need on a daily basis. So um, for those who are more, you know, extroverted, the, you know, there, there is a need for human interaction. For people who are more introverted, the, um, you know, spending time, you know, digesting huge volumes of information uh, and, and having it be more of an internal activity is, is energizing. And, Neither one is right or wrong. There are people have enormously successful with both an extroverted personality and an introverted personality. But in terms of daily happiness, um, don't underestimate this you know, in you know, your profile as a, as a person. I'll give you a personal example. When I was a scientist, I loved the intellectual process of doing science, but I, I found it enormously lonely because I spent a lot of my days in a room by myself. Uh, actually, it was a room with no windows by myself. And so it just, it just was really a lonely existence. I loved the science, but I, I found it lonely. Um, so it just wasn't going to be right for me for a 20-year stretch, as an example. OK, I'm going to move to the next box. So I talked a bit about the what. You know, what uh, energizes you both in terms of what puts you into flow and what kinds of personal interactions you need. Um, I'm going to pivot over to the who. And uh, there's another bit of behavioral science that I found uh, fascinating. So it's, um, this is the bad apple experiment. So what you do if you want to um, do the bad apple experiment is you, you hire an actor, OK? And the actor is going to jump into like a work group. And they're going to be the bad apple in the work group. And um, so they play a variety of different roles. They can be a jerk or a slacker or just a downer, you know, a little bit like an Eeyore. You know, everything's, everything's uh, you know, everything's bad and, and uh, you know, no fun. So if you had to guess, you take a group of people and, you know, 10 people, and you, you ask them to do a task without the bad apple, and then you ask them to do the same task uh, or control group with the bad apple, what kind of average difference in productivity do you think you get with and without the, uh, the bad apple? Any guesses? 30? It's a good guess. It's a great guess, actually. So it's 37, right? <laughs> Uh, so you're almost dead on. So um, 
so the, the, the presence of one person who's kind of negative drops the rest of the group by 37%. I think that's incredible. So, you know, the natural question is, well, why is that? Why, why could, how could one person have such a profound impact on the rest of the group? Well, the answer is, it, it goes back to um, a little bit also how we're wired as humans. So part of our neurological system, which is referred to as mirror neurons, and mirror neurons are super important um, as babies, right? So you guys, if you have little people in your life, uh, you probably have experienced something similar to what's being shown here on the screen, where presumably the, the dad and the baby are interacting. And before the baby can talk, the baby is imitating uh, you know, sticking tongue out or, or opening mouth or going cross-eyed, et cetera. This is a very natural thing. This is a part of how, um, you know, we as humans learn, and I think also as uh, many primates learn. They're super important to learning, but they also have this, I don't know if it's an intentional or unintentional side effect, which is uh, mirror neurons are central to um, how emotions and feelings, behaviors spread between people. So because we have this mirror neuron capability in our brains, that is why that one bad apple affects a group, because we are, you know, we're fundamentally social animals. And so um, as it turns out, there's been a lot of scientific research done that happiness and motivation and persistence and habits, both good and bad, by the way, all of these things are contagious. And so because you don't usually think of those things being contagious, right? But they are, in fact, all of them are contagious. So why does that matter? Well, it matters to make the point that who you work with really matters in terms of uh, you know, your happiness with, it, with whatever it is that you do. So even if the actual work itself is very flow creating and it, you, know, you love it, if you're working with people who bring you down or uh, you know, just don't match you well, uh, you're likely not to enjoy it, and you're likely not to enjoy it every single day, uh, which is a long way, to, a horrible way to spend your life. And so the, part of the point here, too, is as you think about a career and you're thinking about um, alternatives that you might pursue, friends actually outperform acquaintances on all tasks. So as, you, as you're thinking about, well, what do I, you know, what do I want to do with my career? Looking for a place where the people are people that you are already friends with or you could foresee yourself being friends with is enormously important. Now, I chose the picture of uh, Steve Wozniak and Steve Jobs, um, not, you know, not randomly. Um, if you think about founding, you know, founders of, of companies, one of, the ob you know, one of the observations is they virtually always come in pairs, right? So Steve and Steve and, you know, Bill Gates and Paul Allen, right? So the list goes on and on and on. I don't think that's a coincidence. I think that um, this social aspect of uh, and complementarity of personalities uh, is enormously important in all, you know, all aspects of um, you know, the work world, including starting, starting a new company. Okay, so we all, you know, we had many respondents a minute ago who professed their love of Sudoku. Um, so who, who, who said they liked Sudoku? Show of hands. Who, who, uh... Okay, so... So if I offered you a job doing Sudoku for the next 20 years, I'm going to pay you. You can keep, keep your same salary, right? Uh, but that's all you get to do, right? You're just going to do Sudoku. Uh, would you take it? No. no. Well, why not? You just told me. I mean, we just say, I just walked through all this research. Flow is good for you. You're going to get all the flow you can handle. You just have to crank out Sudoku after Sudoku. So, like, that's not good? No? Okay. Well, why not, though? It's monotonous. I think there's something else, too. I think that's true. Uh, I also think that one of the things that we all seek is we want to we have achieved, we want to have produced something, right? You, you know, you want to re reflect back on your career. You want to have felt as though you've added something uh, to the world. I think that's a natural human phenomenon. And w one of the authors that I think ca captured this notion uh, the best is um, Jim Collins, who's the author of Good to Great and Built to Last and a variety of other uh, great books. And so in, in Built to Last, he talked about uh, big, hairy, audacious goals. And you know, he defines it, he calls it a BHAG. That's the, uh, the acronym. Um, 
you know, he talks about it engages people, it reaches out uh, and grabs them in the gut. It is tangible, it is energizing, it's highly focused, and people get it right away, and it takes little or no explanation. Um, and he's talking about this mostly in the context of making a great company, but I also think as you're thinking about a profession, having a profession where the, you know, the organization that you're joining has some sort of big goal that you wanna be a part of, you know, it's a mission that you connect with is really, really important. And I thought I'd share a couple of uh, examples, right? So um, this is probably the world's most famous uh, big, hairy, audacious goal, which was John F. Kennedy in the 60s, who um, said, hey, you know, by the end of this decade, we should put a man on the moon and return him safely to Earth. Uh, at the time, like, none of the technology existed to be able to do this. This was a shocking um, aspiration for a president to put kind of on a nation, but it really energized our country and got people very focused in uh, you know, trying to achieve this goal and ultimately uh, it was achieved. You know, oh, by the way, the, the, has anybody ever heard the expression of a moonshot? Like this is the, this is the moonshot, right? I mean, that, that, that is where this comes from. It's a moonshot because you had to shoot to the moon and back. Um, but there are also a, a variety of um, you know, big, hairy, audacious goals in business. So, you know, Ford at the time he was uh, founding the Ford Motor Company had the goal of democratizing the automobile and replacing the horse, which in 1907, that was a big goal. Or Sony, at the time that Sony decided to pursue the transistor radio, uh, a radio was a piece of furniture. It weighed about 100 pounds, it was made of wood, and you know, you you'd have like a lamp on top of it, right? I mean, it was, it, it, you know, and the family gathered around it, like, you know, gathering around the fireplace because it was big. So the, the notion or the aspiration of having a pocketable radio was transformative at that time. And of course, you know, they went on and succeeded and, uh, you know, changed actually culture as a result because music became portable. Um, Pixar, at the time it was founded by uh, Ed, Ed Catmull, um, you know, the notion of creating a feature length film uh, entirely with computer animation was something no one, not only was it not done, it was no one yet had really even conceived the ability to do that. So the point being is not that any of these things are good or bad, it's about there, there, there are aspirations that motivated a big group of people and a, you know, people were drawn to it and had this you know, emotional reaction of, I wanna be a part of that, I wanna go make that happen. So the reason why I'm raising all of this is as you're reflecting upon your own career, you know, what kind of big, hairy, audacious goal so intrigues you that you could work on it for 10 years and feel like, look back at the end of a decade and say, that was time well spent. I, I really, I am, I'm professionally satisfied by you know, planting a flag on that particular peak and making an explicit thought process. I'm gonna talk about the fourth of my, uh, my four quadrants. And uh, I'm gonna talk a little bit about Ben Franklin. So, you know, Ben Franklin was a pretty accomplished fellow, actually. Um, so, you know, he was actually, in his time, a, a great inventor. Uh, so the Franklin stove, bifocals, the lightning rod, flippers, I mean, you know, just a huge variety of different things that uh, he uh, invented. Uh, from, a, from the point of view of science, um, and by the way, he never actually had a formal education beyond, I think, uh, like grade school, maybe early high school. Um, but he postulated and then uh, was able to um, you know, do experiments that showed uh, both there was this notion of positive charge, negative charge, and conservation of charge. Uh, he was a social innovator. So the, you know, the concept of libraries and town fire departments, these things didn't exist before Franklin and he uh, and others you know, kind of created those ideas and made them kind of standard. A lot of the things that you think of as the standard stuff inside of a town, like that's Ben Franklin. Or you know, and obviously there are a lot of things he's better known for like being uh, one of the authors of the Constitution and the uh, Declaration of Independence. So this dude got a lot done, right? He got a lot done, but on the flip side, one of the things that people don't think about, at least I, I don't think many people think about as much with Ben Franklin is, well, what kind of a person was he? And it's not that he was a bad person, but he wasn't a great 
family person, actually. So, you know, he, one of his uh, roles he had later in his career was he was the U.S. ambassador to France. And in those days, right, you, you didn't hop on a plane to go to France, you took a ship. And so he was in France for, you know, the better part of a decade. And, um, you know, his wife was towards the end of her life. She's, you know, ill and, and she's like, boy, I'd really like to see you. You, you know, I'm not feeling well. I don't know how much longer I'm going to live. And he's just like, yeah, no, nah, well, you know, I'm doing important stuff here in France. And the whole point is he, he never actually made it back. She, she died without him. Uh, he also, during the, you know, the time period of the American Revolution, his family was split. So his son, you know, one of his sons, uh, William, actually sided with England and um, they never reconciled, right? So, you know, he was obviously, Ben Frank was obviously on the side of, you know, independent country, no king. Uh, his son was not on that side. And um, at, at his death, they, they hadn't really uh, resolved that. So why am I sharing that? Well, you, I'm trying to get at in this last box related to long, longer term and relationships, you make these trade-offs, all of us make these trade-offs um, over a career, but you also make them every day. And um, so, uh, you know, and, and the, the thing that, we all share is we all share, we have 168 hours in a week. That's it. We, we, nobody's got more than that. And so uh, you have to make a conscious decision about you know, how much you dedicate to whatever it is that motivates you professionally versus um, how, how deep and, and long lasting are your relationships with, um, with whoever it is you choose to have relationships with. Uh, and because there's only 168 hours, there, it really is a trade-off. You, you know, I don't think that uh, you can pick up some point on that line, but you can't, you can't pick a line you know, somewhere off the line because it requires more than 168 hours. That's a picture of uh, my bride on our wedding day. But uh, you know, for me anyway, uh, this notion of you know, whether it's marriage or anything or relationship with children, uh, it isn't something that just happens. It's something you have to be, uh, you know, you have to create. And I, I, I like that quote a lot and I believe in it uh, very much. Four critical questions to ask yourself. You know, what types of work activities put me, uh, put you into flow? What types of people do you enjoy working with the most? Um, what big, hairy, audacious goal so intrigues or inspires you that you could work on it for a decade? And what meaningful relationships do you want to have? And I, uh, my guidance is to really, really think about these things, to really study these things for yourself, and literally fill in this grid. Fill in what those, those things are for you. All right, so last section, uh, dreaming big, betting small, iterating, and learning. Upon graduation uh, from school, the world is your oyster, the opportunity space is vast, and throughout your career, the opportunity space is vast. However, uh, particularly if you, as you run towards graduation, uh, something that isn't vast is your time between today and when you graduate. That, that is, in fact, fixed and getting smaller. And so, um, you know, there is actually a an, an whole industry that is very consistent in its ability to find kind of needles in the haystack, really good things in a very large space. Uh, anybody know? Anybody have any thoughts as to what, what industry I'm referring to or thinking of? Bingo, venture capital, bang on. So how does venture capital actually do that? Right? It's a fascinating, you know, fascinating consistency in result, but what's the mechanics of it? Well, in rough terms, this is how the venture capital industry works. And I've never been a venture capitalist, but um, these, this data is from that industry. So what you see in the bars are uh, rounds of funding, right? So uh, venture capitalists, uh, there's no good data on how many business plans they see on an annual basis, but it's a lot, right? Tens of thousands. Um, at the, I can't remember which year I pulled this from, but in that year that I did pull it from, uh, there were about 1,100 um, companies that got seed round funding, uh, 500 that got second round, 300, third round, et cetera. So what you can see is the funding rate, uh, the rate at which companies get funding decreases uh, as you go to further rounds, but the absolute amount of funding increases. And what venture capitalists are doing is they are using criterion to decide on those funding decisions uh, throughout the funding process. So, um, you know, in early stages, there's a lot less information about the company because it may only be a single person with an idea. Um, so, you know, different criteria there. Later stages, you know, it's, it's about actual results. So, What's the analogy between 
you know, planning and thinking about your career versus venture capital? Well, I'm glad you asked. Here are some things to think about. So if you think about the mechanics of venture capital, I think I'm going to argue there's an analogy between lots of business plans and lots of career ideas. Okay? And there's an analogy between um, funding criteria and your career criteria. And then there's an iterative stage gate process. That's the same on both sides. Uh, but the big difference is instead of investing money, you're investing time. Okay? If you wanted to have a large collection of really good initial career ideas, how would you create it? Um, so that's in, if you want to start at the front, front end of the funnel, you have to have something to work with, right? So here's an idea on how to do that. So um, we get a little bit of the uh, matrix technology, and you can self-replicate yourself like Agent Smith. Uh, you could run a controlled experiment with thousands of versions of yourself uh, and just let that play out, and you'd know exactly the best career based on uh, experience. So sadly, that technology does not exist. But uh, there's a uh, suitable analogy that I would argue you can use. Uh, which is uh, the career website. So, um, you know, here at MIT or uh, lots of other places, uh, there are literally thousands and thousands of uh, graduates who have done a whole variety of uh, different things. And uh, so in the case of when I pulled this record from MIT, it was almost 200,000 uh, individuals. Um, and the point is uh, to really think about you know, what are people like me doing? And how happy are they with what they are doing? I took the uh, task of examining that question uh, for myself. So I uh, have a physics degree from MIT. And so here, here are just some of the places that uh, MIT physics grads have gone um, you know, with their careers. So education is heavily represented in, you know, at MIT and, and uh, thousands of other schools a whole host of different technology companies, consulting, government, venture capital, banking. Um, and it's not to say this is either good or bad. It's just to give a flavor of the variety of different careers that people um, you know, with this background have pursued. And, um, and so as a starting point, understanding that breadth, I think, is very, very valuable. Um, and then you know, to think about narrowing that set, right, because you can't you can't you know, pursue 100 things or 1,000 things. You've got to start narrowing it to things that might be better uh, fit for you as a uh, professional. And the point here is that early on, when you've got a long list, you want to be like a venture capitalist. You only want to put down seed money, right? You don't want to invest a huge amount of time. You just want to invest enough time to decide that something isn't a good idea. Uh, basically. And you can do that a variety of different ways. With small investments of uh, energy, you can do like things like look at Glassdoor reviews on a company or a LinkedIn search of people who work there. Or if it's more at the industry level, you can you know, read books or articles or, or uh, you know, websites on that industry. That is a low investment mechanism of deciding maybe what doesn't get to the next round. Um, as you go deeper into the process, you can uh, talk to people, alumni uh, who, you know, of, of uh, your school and, um, you know, who are working at that company, what's their experience like, and, you know, so forth and so on. I mean, the, the largest, m biggest investment you can actually make is to go work there, right? That's the equivalent of putting all your chips into, uh, you know, a relatively big bet. Um, and the whole notion is there's lots of things you can do that are smaller bets and help you to understand whether or not what you think something is really like is actually close to what it actually is really like in the real world. So if you pull it all together, you, know, you want to have um, tens or hundreds of total ideas, and then you want to screen them down um, or, you know, with increasing investments in time to get down to a very narrow list that uh, is what you actually interview and pursue uh, in a job as a career. What do you use as a screen? Well, you're, you, I would argue those criterion we had worked on in that last section. You know what puts you into flow. You know what kind of human interactions you need. You know what kinds of people 
um, you want to work with and what kind of goals you want to achieve over uh, your career and, and what kind of balance you want to have between your personal life and your professional life. All of those things are part of what you're looking to examine alternate companies or alternate careers against. Um, and then, again, it's an iterative process. As you learn, you, you modify uh, the list and put more energy into things that look better in terms of a fit uh, for yourself. So four, four last thoughts. Dream big. Uh, enter your career with great confidence. There's very little that you can't do. Set aside time, you know, is uh, for all of us, you know, um, there's no extra time to do this. Uh, so the only way to get it to happen is you have to make time. And in particular, this time to do any sort of self-reflection as to, you know, what you love and what gives you energy and what kinds of goals you want to pursue. Um, you know, the, uh, if I were to say, if you make a mistake of over-investing in any part of the process, I'd be over-investing in really knowing yourself well. That's small. Um, you start with a wide set and, and try little investments in time simply to decide whether or not it's worth moving to the next stage. And talk to people. I think one of the mistakes that a lot of people make, particularly early on in their career, is they assume that people who are deeper into their career don't want to talk to them. And my experience is that's almost never the case. Uh, if you ask somebody for their time, particularly if you share a school or you share some aspect of your background, in my experience, almost uni uh, uniformly, the person who is being asked would say, sure, I'd be happy to share with you my experience and why I chose to do what I did and how I, what I think about uh, what I'm doing relative to um, you know, uh, what I thought I'd be doing or uh, my level of happiness, et cetera. And then the final thing is, you know, pretend it's, you know, 20 years from now and you're giving this talk. You know, what would uh, your story of greatness be and what stories of having achieved great goals and having worked with great people uh, would you, you know, would you want to be able to share? So that's, uh, that's what I had for you today. So I appreciate your attention. Thank you.